couple of days ago I read an online article about Zoom schooling at home. That got me started because I'm interested in technology of course and using it now and I do some work in that area. It's been very educational for me and I really do appreciate technology but one of the problems I have with technology is that like in any discipline or any art or any, any major that people do, it becomes for the practitioners the whole world and things get out of balance. But anyway, the, the, there's a picture in the article with some kids studying at the t kitchen table and I thought, wow, it struck me just how intrusive technology has become. Not only do kids study at home, but now they're going to school at home with Zoom on the kitchen table. And then, oh, the kitchen table, yes. The kitchen table used to mean so much to me as a symbol of family. In Japan, we used to eat at izakaya. They're kind of like uh, pub-type atmosphere. Friday nights, all the working people go to the izakaya and sit around tables like drinking and eating green beans and all kinds of things. Very happy times, release from the five days of work. And the table is there. And I thought, yeah, the table, the table, the table. And, but you know, despite Da Vinci, Jesus probably didn't even sit at a table. So I don't know where the kids would do their homework. They used to recline at the meal. There are lots of models, lots of cultures, lots of ways to live and do things. And what you need is a sense of joy, release, freedom from judgment. So wherever you do it, however you do it, it's peace and there's connection. There's a chance for empathy rather than the barrier of all these rules and techniques between you and your kids. Just get about it, engage. But I looked up a lot of articles and found a lot of great advice. And I printed off a lot of these things and thought, oh, a lot of my friends would be interested in this, but by the time I get to this morning, having considered it in the last hour or two in bed, listening to the texts being read by one of those robotic voices, Oh, I'm reminded of a story which I'm going to tell you in a little while about being a pastor. I was a pastor for a very short time. A lot of conflict, a lot of beautiful times in it, a lot of victories, a lot of understanding came, but a lot of conflict as well because the conflict was this, that I was a pastor. I wasn't a therapist. Pastors are preacher pastors anyway. You can make lots of categories out of pastors, I suppose, but I understood myself to be somebody who didn't tell people the right thing to do in technique, which I think creates a sense of failure, but I wanted to give them something that made them feel loved, despite the success of their efforts or the failures of their efforts. That's the ministry of the pulpit to me that not that there's a right technique or the technology is the key to everything or technique is the key to everything, but that you are loved despite your efforts. And even at times, well, not at times, you're loved despite trying or not trying. Some of us just give up. So as a pastor, you preach sermons or you give advice. Preaching and giving advice are two different things. One's is telling things as they ultimately are. I mean, ultimately, behind all the efforts and all the human performance and everything else. How are things? That's the ministry of the pulpit. And the, the things are like this in, in Christianity. And I, I think most people want it to be like this regardless of their religion. That is that behind everything is the impulse and love. And, and when I say love, I mean unfailing generosity and kindness from whatever is behind every effort, every change, every move every expression of energy, love. Or you can give advice. You can tell people how to be kind.
culturally Christian, culturally Islamic, culturally Buddhist, whatever. The very big difference between those rules and the ministry of grace in Christianity. The pulpit, I, I expected that the pulpit would be regarded as the place where you come to be reminded that your efforts are worthwhile regardless because you are loved. So I'm all for advice and uh, that kind of stuff, but once you take it into the pulpit, advice I mean, once you take advice into the pulpit as the ministry, then you bring God out of heaven and stick him in the mud. And uh, not because doing the right thing or trying to do the best you can is wrong, but because if you if you're not if you don't have that one hour, two hours a week, those minimal ministries <laughs> that reaffirm the love context that we do all these things in, then the effort becomes horrible, burdensome, impossible. So people come to church and be told the right thing to do. For example, for a Christian family. And uh, I, I did that myself at times until I got into my second year of preaching and a lot of conflicts were resolved when I realised that these people are burdened with the right thing to do. And where's their relief coming from? Being told the right thing to do again and again every week. I would go visiting at times and I loved that. I mean, it was <laughs> exhausting, a reasonably large congregation, but I loved to go visiting. Sometimes I felt that the folks I was visiting were under enormous pressure because of this dualism from their pulpit. Ashamed to do the wrong thing because they've been told what is the Christian cultural right thing to do, how to, how to rear your children and so on. Not kind of, sometimes not, maybe often not welcoming me as a minister whose feet are shod with the gospel of grace so that to have a meal with a family could either be an exercise in demonstrating we are a good Christian family or could be really happy laughing at, at our flaws and foibles and, and, and the, the naughty things kids do and so on like that, learning to cope with them because this bloke comes into your home and to your table loving you, not, not judging you, not expecting to see how good you've done, how good a job you've done as a parent or a couple. No, no, quite the opposite actually. <laughs> but when you have this schizophrenic ministry, that is to say advice versus the grace that welcomes all people of all kinds, then of course you're going to have people that are worried about are they doing it right. Good morning, sir. People are very nice at this time of morning. So life is art and there are challenges, but they're challenges which actually don't have failure as an option because in everything we do, we are being loved. We are loved. Your kids are loved. 2012, I was writing about not knowing. <laughs> so I'm going to put that here too. That piece. It, it's kind of obvious that we can't afford to be blaming and accusing and fearing and feeling guilty about failures. I mean, we just don't know enough. We're not skilled enough to be that damn clever that we can escape error, fault, blame, regardless of the source of the ideals. I mean, the nature of knowledge 
and ignorance and both are true it's such that we we might need ideals so we've got a direction but my god we can't afford to have them as the cause of fear and condemnation and fear of failure because that becomes the fear of effort fear of trying all that's got to go and we've got to detach effort from God in the sense that we detach effort from the knowledge of God as one who requires effort all you need is to be loved not that we loved God but that he loved us Preaching is a little bit different. It's not a science. It's not a recommendation. It's a declaration of a fact that is not obvious to the human mind that is cluttered with. Things that arise because of the need to improve, 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 or correct, or correct, or... The way we should be treating all those things is as art, as ways of expressing the glory of what we are, what we've been made to be, what we, the, the joy of the responsibility of being stewards in creation. That's not understood. This Genesis guilt trap thing with the fall and the, the depravity of man, so-called. It's, it's not the beginning of the universe, the middle of the universe, or the end of it. The gospel of Christ is, that is to say, the surprising revelation that God is love. That's a contrast and not a continuum. It's a contrast. The world was made by him, for him, through him, to him, and so on. And he's love. So if we cast all our efforts and child-rearing and so on into the context of redemption, we cast them into the context of God who judges. That's not the gospel ministry. You can try and improve God's world by techniques out of guilt or because that's the joy of being human. Christianity ought to be the most humanistic uh, insight that you could get because on the one hand you have a humanism that tries to improve on God's world without Christ or you uh, that's the first Adam Adam the failure and the whole theory of sin entering the world and so on because of a command that's guilt that's it's all based on the idea of God as a judge, where you have failure and you have the need to improve things and to be good for this judge. But that's the first Adam. The second Adam is not a continuation of the story of the first Adam. It's a complete contrast. The second Adam is a being born again thing. It's a, not a reformation and not, not an improvement. It's, it's a completely new creation. Christian texts are quite clear on that, that the new creation is a fact. It's not a possibility, it's a fact. The rest, the Buddhists would say, use the word illusion, the rest is illusion. We're, we're living by the illusion that we're being punished all the time. And so we do things just with crazy motives. Oh, well, to cut a long story short, what we should be saying is that the, the privilege of bringing kids up is a love thing, but the need to improve, fix, repair God's failures turns them into quite a chore. So I don't consider the gospel to be a technique. I was never a preacher of, sorry, I was never meant to be a preacher of technique. 
full of culture, Jewish culture, Judeo-Christian culture, so-called Christian culture. Culture takes care of itself. It'll happen. But I'll never turn a culture or a tradition into the gospel itself. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No culture is ideal enough to take the place of that love, that grace. Once you take advice into the pulpit as the ministry, then you bring God out of heaven and stick him in the mud. And uh, not because doing the right thing or trying to do the best you can is wrong, but because if you if you're not if you don't have that one hour, two hours a week, those minimal ministries <laughs> that reaffirm the love context that we do all these things in, then the effort becomes horrible, burdensome, impossible. Ah, good morning. Don't fall in there. Oh, sorry, mate. Good morning. What's the problem? Fire well, you better go and put it out quickly. Why? Well, God, it's your fault. <laughs> 